the Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. Whoever is um, listening or watching or both, welcome. Uh, lovely to have Adam Wagner with us here, uh, known, uh, I hope, to many of you as a human rights barrister. I'm going to describe him as a panjandrum of the pandemic, a doyen of the disease laws, a guru of the guidelines, an oracle of the ordinances, all 65 of them. And if you still doubt me, let me quote this from Hansard last month during a debate in the House of Lords on the amendments to the 2020 regulations, we'll talk about them later, in which Baroness Jewel Jones of Moolscombe said, my lords, once again, I congratulate Adam Wagner, the human rights barrister, on analyzing and explaining all these coronavirus regulations. At the moment, he's perhaps the only person in the country who can make sense of this variety of regulations. He's doing a huge public service. Hear, hear. For those of you in the audience who think that uh, we lawyers are equally familiar with the 65 edits, 27 pieces of, of, of uh, regulations and the two statutes passed, or the one statute passed since March last year, let me just say, it's not my specialist area, it's not our specialist area. We rarely get paid to look into them, um, which is where Adam comes in. Um, I would suggest, Adam, you've got an unrivaled knowledge of the 102 sections of the Act and the plethora of regulations that it has uh, spawned. Uh, some quickly drafted, as you know, with astonishing speed, um, but not entirely clear, and largely brought into being with no parliamentary scrutiny, which is a subject we have to come on to later. But Adam knows much more than you or I about all of this. But well, let's get on with uh, asking. Adam, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And thanks to Mishkons as well. Take us to the beginning. The very first law, when and how was it introduced? So all of the COVID lockdown regulations have been passed under um, a, a piece of legislation called the Public Health Control of Disease Act 1984, which has within it an emergency regulation making power and a super emergency regulation making power. And in a super emergency, it's not how it describes it, but where it's not reasonably practicable to lay the um, instrument before Parliament before it comes into force and get it approved, um, the government can effectively bring in new criminal laws without any parliamentary scrutiny at all until at least 28 days later. Um, and that's the procedure they've used since February. Just to give you a, a sense of how much things have changed, that original lockdown law was 11 pages long in its PDF form. And the current lockdown law is over 120 pages long. And by current lockdown law, do you mean the, the, the one text from which you would have the source of everything as amended? Yes, yeah, so, so the all tiers regulations, which are the current lock, where the source of the lockdown law. Um, it's it's extremely confusing if you're trying to figure out, and I'm sure when these COVID cases start to roll in, as, as they are doing for me, um, you have to try and figure out what was in place at what time. So it's been, it's certainly not been a process which has been planned. I'll start with what I call my curiosity questions. I receive a text from the NHS telling me to self-isolate because my name's been given by a person who's tested po uh, positive. Um, I feel I've been wrongly identified. Can I do anything about it? When you receive a formal notification from NHS Test and Trace, that triggers a legal duty for you to self-isolate, which can be enforced with um, fixed penalty notices or even the police um, forcibly taking you back to the place where you're meant to be self-isolating. Um, and, and, and very recently, I think last week, the law was changed to allow the police to have access to the test and trace notifications so they, wow. and, and the personal details of individuals. So we're in a slightly, a quite a different enforcement um, place now. If I'm required to self-isolate, am I allowed out to take a test? Um, well, under the, um, under the self-isolation regulations, you can, you can only really go out for very, very limited reasons. Um, one of which is um, to seek medical assistance where this is required urgently, but testing is not included in that list. So I, I don't think you really should be going out to get a test 
um, particularly as you can get um, tests to do at home these days. Right. Um, let's uh, say someone is um, uh, handed a fixed penalty notice for breaching the COVID regulations. Do they have a right of appeal against liability and against quantum? I've um, had quite a lot of fixed penalty notices of, from clients who, which have been successfully challenged. There's no formal way of doing it. There's no formal appeal, unlike a uh, parking fixed penalty notice. But what we, what I've done on behalf of clients is write direct, not not me personally, but solicitors write directly to the police force. You have to do it within the 28 days to avoid having been prosecuted. Okay. Um, someone is stopped in the park by a police officer demanding to know why they're, why they're walking there. They're not, they're not obviously in. Can they be issued with a fixed penalty notice if they say nothing? There's no regulation which requires a member of the public to give any, say anything to a police officer. For example, if they see you gathering in a group of 10 people that doesn't look like your family, then they and they ask everybody what you're doing and no and nobody everybody refuses to answer and they might reasonably believe you're committing an offense for example gathering with more than two people in a public place you might find yourself on the end of a fixed penalty notice if you don't account for yourself okay uh, next question um i have a six-year-old daughter who has uh, a good friend who lives a few doors down uh with her uh, single parent mother is there any restriction on my daughter and the her six-year-old friend seeing each other? Um, outdoors, they could um, take exercise together. I've heard about educational um, bubbling with one other child from a class. Um, I don't know whether that's come from guidance from the Department of Education or not, but from as I understand it, it's the two children bubble within a class who are not going into school um, and technically that since that's sort of the purpose of education you, it does you know fall within a reasonable excuse. Um, I, I, as a chronic asthma sufferer I understand that I'm exempt from the obligation to wear a mask but am I required to show proof of my exemption and can I be served with a fixed penalty notice for not showing proof of the exemption? Well as you say, it's a reasonable excuse not to wear a face covering if you've got any physical or mental illness or impairment or disability um, that would prevent you from wearing the, the face mask. Um, I think it can be potentially unlawful uh, indirect discrimination to or even harassment to, you know, make somebody prove it. Um, on the other hand, as with a lot of these regulations questions, it's a bit vague. Um, and everybody, every shop and police officer will handle it slightly different. Um, incoming exocet of, of quarantine hotels for, uh, for people coming from abroad. Question, uh, is this an absolute certainty that's going to be introduced? Um, uh, question one, question two, when? Question three, forcing someone to pay for a hotel? Seriously? Compliance with ECHR? If, I think the answer is they, they will, what, what they will look like is a big question um, and there's a whole range of possibilities from the most extreme possible regulations which will be detention of individuals which will give rise to a whole host of legal problems um, and potential issues. In terms of whether they will make people pay for it, um, you know, we're going to build a wall and we'll make, make, make Mexico pay for it um, is effectively what's going on. I think they will, because that's the policy. There's World Health Organization regulations, which apparently we've signed up to, which don't allow for this. However, whether that's legally, um, whether those are legally actionable or not, I don't know. But even if there would be an argument later on down the line, in retrospect, they're not going to, the, court, the court's pretty unlikely to um, stick their oar in to prevent the scheme going ahead. But, but that's, but who knows? The, the, the regulations are being introduced with an alarming absence of any real scrutiny, certainly no parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and, and, and I've got to admit, I, I, I worry, particularly with this government, as we know, it doesn't exactly have an exemplary record, but is this going to lead to a general reduction in the scrutiny of laws? I think this has been coming for a long time, um, the use of Henry VIII powers. In Brexit is definitely one area 
where they've been they're, they're now empowered through the withdrawal act to mm -hmm. um to use them in all sorts of areas if you had said a year ago and we're on the 3rd of february literally a year ago if you had said in a year's time there will have been twice weekly um draconian criminal laws brought into power by matt hancock signing a piece of paper you would have you would have sort of you know laughed me out of court my, my worry is we've been you know a frog being boiled during this past year in terms of parliamentary scrutiny in terms of the rule of law and in terms of exec executive power so we now accept as okay as fine um that the government can just decide on extringent new criminal laws with it, which affect everybody's lives and in to the to the extent of what we can and can't do in our own homes mm. um, and they'll be brought in just by the flick of a minister's pen to combine brexit and that henry the eighth power the Scottish fishermen who came down to London to demonstrate were apparently being handed fixed party notices by the Met. Yeah. Um, because I, I think they removed demonstration as a uh, an exemption. Is there any way you might argue that um, that that sort of lobbying is a, a, a on behalf of a business is a is a legitimate business activity? Well, look, uh, protest is the lifeblood of democracy. It's the it's the safety valve. It's how the population tells yeah. the government um, what it thinks and um, when it can't, when it doesn't, when it feels that other methods have failed. Protest was was not as a listed reasonable excuse until the autumn, where it was brought in as a as a, as a listed reasonable excuse, and it was taken out in, at the end of December when the um, when tier four came in. It was taken out. I think the police are probably wrong to treat protest as being banned. Um, I think it's probably contrary to Article 10 and 11 of the European Convention. Um, and I think it really needs to be put in front of a judge very quickly to sort this out because um, it's a problem for democracy if people feel they can't protest. Um, somebody's asked a question about shared gardens. Um, so uh, I'll give you one example where there's a back garden that's used by all four flats. Uh, in, and, and the second one is a communal garden of which there are many in, in certainly in North London where the house is back onto a communal space that's private is being in that space where there are other people allowed providing there's no mixing or mingling so you so say you've got a communal garden then you know you are in the place where you are living um because your that communal garden is part of the place where you are living the question the question is whether you can then gather with people who live mm. in a different flat, say, um, but with, you know, but in this, but ha share the same garden. And I think, I don't know, um, my, my suggestion is just to keep to social distancing. Um, you've all got to use the garden together. So keep two meters, more than two meters away from each other and try not to mingle. Do you know of any existing challenges to the regulations that are on foot by way of judicial review or otherwise um, or, or planned i mean i know of a few planned ones because uh, I've, I've involved with a few planned ones but um there have been other challenges there's been a, quite a lot of pre-action um challenges so threatened challenges which have been settled um because in actual fact i think that during this period the government has been quite amenable to making sensible changes to the regulations or the guidance where, where people pointed out i mean they're, they're doing this on the fly and i think they know that i think the the travel quarantine the original travel quarantine regulations was challenged by airlines um, and that was settled um with a change in the regulations just before it went to court so that was a foot all right um and sorry to ask an interesting one about a client i'm going to quote desperate to leave the uk to avoid being accidentally uk resident tax they found a flight to barbados in late january but thought they'd be breaking the law if they took it. Um, was advised that flying was not an offence if only due to extraterritorial issues, but that the offence was travelling to Heathrow. Is that right? You, you've got it. You're, everybody is subject to the requirement that you can only be outside of your home if you have a reasonable excuse. And um, I, I don't think avoiding um, tax consequences of being in the in the jurisdiction is a listed reasonable excuse and i very much doubt it will be an unlisted reasonable excuse either um but you know th 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 there, are, there seem to be plenty of people 
who are going to the airport and flying off places for all sorts of reasons. But it's it's another grey area. It's another difficult grey area. Uh, yeah. Adam, yeah. you've been a star. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. The Mishkan Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishkan.com.